Red shot. Both of these players are just about ready to shuffle up and begin. We're trying to get all of our video and written feature matches all set aside. We have four feature matches going at a time throughout this entire tournament. We have two which will be up on YouTube, one written which presumably will be up on our website soon after in which it has been completed, and of course this live coverage. This is the first time ARG has been able to broadcast live from round one all the way up until the finals. Of course, I'm Joe Gialanda reporting live from Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm not sure if both players have officially begun shuffling, but looks like they're soon to begin. Nope. In the barrel. I think we're going to have a conversation about shuffling. All right. So it appears as though Scott has rolled a five, and Zachary, of course, rolls a sixth. So we will now begin. Of course, these players will have a slight time extension, so when we hear the overhead begin with the end of match procedures, these players will have a slight time extension. Zachary opens up with a copy of Upstart Goblin. These Patrick Hoban special, as I've said before. And see, this is again, you go first, you have the first opportunity to activate the spell cards, you have the first opportunity to begin cycling through your deck, already banished a blaster, search out another blaster. A very ideal opening for Zachary, exactly where you want to be with this deck. His deck has you know, only six traps in it, which has been interesting. We've seen some Dragoonity and Dragon Ruler decks with a lot of traps. He only has six traps here in this deck. No copy of Vanity's Emptiness. Just two Mirror Force, a Wind Glass, Compulse, a Wobber Q, and a Return from the Different Dimension. So he's going to go ahead and Cards of Consonance, his Phalanx, Summon Doug. This is fantastic. I mean, if you could draw it up, Upstar Goblin, Seven Swords, Cards of Consonance, this is the most ideal opening hand, especially if Scott does not have a Maxi, which, if I look over his deck list, he's not maining a single copy of Maxi, nor is he citing a single copy of Maxi, so... Zachary will be able to have a max C free round two match. So now he's at a decision point exactly how he wants to end his board, what type of field he believes will lock out Scott for the remainder of this duel. A real huge advantage of Dragoonities is you just set up Vadriana, you set up Stardust, Spar Spark Dragon now. That's right, he's not playing any copies of Andy's Emptiness. The ability to go into level 8 so easily and then, oh geez, Garuda, this is a Fascinating play. Now he'll be able to go into another copy of Adriana. So now we see some of the interesting cards. Garuda, the Wind Spirit. Ooh, Gaia Dargan. Zachary is just using all of the unique Dragoon launches out there. Pitching the Zephyros. Yeah, this is just a fantastic opening hand. Fantastic combination of cards here. Now, of course, Garuda, you can banish a Wind Monster to summon it, from the field, summon it to the field. Gaia Dargan able to pitch Black... Wing Zephyros the Elite. So now we see why he's running the single copy of Garuda and the single copy of Zephyros the Elite. Walls it up with a two minute red eyes dark metal dragon. Now he's really putting out an impressive, impressive first field. So it looks like he's running more of a traditional uh, Dragonity build, having, you know, the red eyes darkness metal dragons in it and the Zephyros the Elite in there. As yeah, well. no, he's got plenty of tech in there. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's quite fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do some equipping. going to bounce some cards with. Zephyros, that's just incredible. Being able to bounce the Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon with Zephyros is just an incredible, incredible opening hand here from Zachary. He's really showing the potential of his deck and exactly what it does to add Garuda and Zephyros the Elite to your deck. Those two cards just give it a dimension that I've never really seen before from Dragoonities. And mm -hmm. A lot of players do not play the Garuda, do not play the Zephyros. Absolutely. It'd be interesting. I mean, Zachary is a player who is always in talks with Patrick Hoban. I haven't seen Patrick Hoban's deck list, but it'd be interesting to see if he's also on Dragoonities and he's also on a similar deck list. Let's see. So let's see how strong of an open field you can end this game with. Now, the only two rank fours that uh, Zach does play to take advantage of the Garuda and the Zephyros for anything other than just mm -hmm. know, synchro summoning, uh, he does play the Queen Dragon Jin. That makes and sense. He plays the Love of All Chain to. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Both of those cards, huge synergy for what you're trying to do. Huge synergy. Scott just sitting idly and watching Zachary go off. Beauty He's of these type of decks. Oh, uh, Aegis has an absolutely strong opening hand here. I'm not sure what type of opening hand Scott could have to really make a comeback. A lot of the Weezing cards are a bit slow to say the least. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm actually very familiar with the Bujin deck, uh, or with the Bujin, Bujin deck in general. And he is playing quite a few interesting cards in the deck. Uh, one of the thing, uh, three cards that are essentially dead to him at the moment, unfortunately, uh, he run he made X three Black Horn of Heavens, 
So oh, very since interesting. These, since Zach's already gone off at this point, those cards are essentially dead. I mean, they can stop a play if he gets to the monsters out right now. So if he opened up with a Bujin Yamato and a Crane or an Honest or a way to get to them, he's pretty safe right now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the b biggest thing about Bujins is they don't really care so much if your opponent uh, if you go off against them before they can get set up. Uh, because all it takes is just uh, slow advantage gaining for them to get back on you, especially if you don't have a way to get over their Bujin cranes. I'm not sure what the start is dragging. It might be very difficult. This field is just very dominant. Unless you back this up with something like a Mirror Force, I'm not sure what Scott could have. Yeah, Zach does run the Mirror for two Mirror Force, a Phoenix Wing, and a Compulse yeah. to uh, play offensively, but he also plays the one mm -hmm. Wabaku to keep it protected as well, yeah, keep it from being destroyed in general. You see, the interesting thing, a lot of the things in Scott's deck, he'd really love to open them. Kaiser Coliseum, first of all. I remember back when I played that card in Rescue Rabbit Variants, I would always side it out going second or third in the side deck games. But going first, being able to summon Saber Source, and oh, look at that. Scott's just going to continue. He understands that there's yep. no point in revealing what deck he's playing to Zachary. Leave him in the dark, side decking, fantastic decision. See, that's a play that I wrote an article about where you have to weigh the percentages. If my opponent has absolutely positively nothing, and if absolutely everything goes well, am I going to get into a position where I win the game? And he probably looked at that field and said, I could probably kill Vadriana, I could probably kill this guy, but then I don't, don't have enough to the Red-Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, don't have enough to the Dragon Ruler. The likelihood of me winning the game is probably about 1%. Yep. Is it more advantageous to keep my opponent in the dark, not know what I'm playing, not know how to side, and perhaps miss side, assuming he's playing one of the popular decks in the format? Yep. In this case, I definitely think it was the Oh, yeah, absolutely. If I mean, just revealed that he's playing Bujins, then uh, Zach would have pretty a, a pretty good idea of what to cite in against him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this way keeps him in the dark. We, we'll be interested to see what Zachary decides to do. I mean, he has cards like... Oh, he's citing Six Sense. That's fascinating. These players not putting Six Sense in their main deck. I yeah. am just shocked. It I mean, definitely is. Yeah, Scott is not using the card at all, either. Yeah, well, boo gents don't really have a good way to take advantage of it because still of how many trap six cents, though. I know. It's one of those things that if it goes off, awesome for you. But if you have to start mm -hmm. milling cards and you mill four of your trap cards, you're pretty deep in the hole at that point. Yeah, very understandable. Well, 497 viewers. We are almost at 500 viewers here at the Alter Reality Game Circuit Series live in Worcester, Massachusetts. Very excited to see that. Every round, it seems like we're getting a few hundred more players, so, or viewers, rather. We go, yeah, hopefully. Players are good, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, have, we have a lot of players, too. Just a hair under 440. 439, last I checked, making this the largest Ultra Rally Game Circuit Series event in our brief history. This is only the third time, of course, which we've held one of these events. First time we're being able to bring you live coverage around one and beyond. This year is round two of the Ultra Rally Game Circuit Series event. Nope. We're watching we just him. broke 500. We have, in fact, broke 505. Congratulations, everyone who's here today joining us in Worcester, Massachusetts, wherever you are across the globe. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming you with here, Kalen. We'll be here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, Scott and Zachary are in the midst of side decking. Of course, we have a match right now between Zachary Leverett and Scott Gear. Bujins versus Dragoonity Rulers. Yeah, yeah, we saw Zach utilize some of his interesting tech choices like Ruta and Zephyros and some of the interactions that this deck can accomplish to really establish a board that Scott could not come back from. Scott decided to scoop the game, reveal it. Not a single card, leave Zachary in the dark. Hopefully have the ability to side advantageously, go first, establish a field that Zachary would not otherwise be able to deal with. And then, you know, who knows what will happen in Game 3, but Absolutely. it's really a fantastic decision by Scott not yeah. to reveal a single card. And he's got... He has quite the side deck prepared for this. He's got double DD Crow to hit yeah, the absolutely. phalanxes and mm -hmm. the dragons. He's got effect failures to stop the ducks plays. Uh, he's got MSTs that he yeah. doesn't main mm -hmm. for some reason. I do question not maining MSTs in the Bujins. I do know, I do understand that Bujin and Quillen can pop face-ups and Centipede yeah. can Centipede, destroy yeah. spell traps. But MST is still so mm -hmm. important because that field spell. Because you can't use either of those cards on your opponent's mm -hmm. turn. And that's yeah. when they use their field spell. Yeah, this is true, this is true. So. It's up. so it looks like uh, the players are shuffled up, all finished with side decking, and we'll be jumping right back into our overshot. So here Scott, of course, will be going first, seeing as how he was unable to establish anything in the first game. He literally did not put a single card on the board. So now we see that both the black and the white alt reality games circuit series events. These are the first time in which we have made these alt reality game circuit series events. Side events throughout the weekend for only $5. These eight-man tournaments will reward the winner with an ARG Circuit Series playmat and enough points to earn an invitation to the ARG Circuit Series Championship next summer, where over $20,000 will be dispersed throughout the prize pool. And if you've already acquired the necessary 20 points to enter the Alter Reality Games Invitational Circuit Series Event Championship, whatever you'd like to call it, upcoming next summer, you can build up to the 120-point threshold to earn a round one buy, sleep in, 
or the 220 points necessarily necessary to begin the, game, the day 2 and 0 oh, and have the ability to sleep in. So it looks like here we have a tanky to get Buijin, Yamato, and a pot of duality revealing a Fiendish chain. I'm not sure I quite made out the other card, but the effect veil in which he decided to take. So Exactly. So yeah, he's right. actually in a very good position at this mm -hmm. point. As long as he's got the traps to back up Yamato, mm -hmm. he's got this pretty solidly. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. he may not, uh, he may not uh, obviously blow him out on in a few in just one or two turns, uh, but he's in a very solid position with only one trap to back him up. Though uh, this could be bad. It'll be interesting. He's adding. Which one is that? I wasn't able to tell. I think he's yet. adding a Mikazuchi to keep uh, Beast Warrior on the field, mm -hmm. which means he probably has the crane in hand already. He'll probably pitch uh, you know, like a Centipede or a Turtle. Mm -hmm. Because Mikazuchi, when a Beast Warrior type Bujin monster you control is destroyed, you get to special summon him. Uh, while his other effect isn't used all that much, because you do have to send a Bujin monster from your hand to the grave while you control Mikazuchi. And in the end phase, you get a Bujin Spell or Trap card. Uh, the only ones that do. Uh, that, aside from ditching them off of Yamato's effect, are Bujingi Crane and Bujing Bujingi Crow, which he runs three cranes and one crow. Yes, absolutely. So it'll be interesting now, Zachary. Looks like he's opened up with Tempest, discarding Phalanx to activate the effect of Tempest. Oh, Obviously, he, actually, uh, he actually ditched the Mikazuchi to the graveyard. Oh, he ditched the Mizuchi. So he may have a, may have a, he may be bluffing him and he may have a sword face down, but I'm not entirely sure. Oh, certain. yes, absolutely. That's definitely a possibility. but I'm not exactly sure what sword would actually do for him at this point. Uh, I'm, interested I'm curious about, the, I'm curious about I mean, this play. He may have added a crane and had to ditch the Mikazuchi, but I'm not Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure what that plays about. This so is fascinating. It'll be interesting to see what there happens. There's the Baylor on uh, the ducks. ducks. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, he does shut him down for a turn. Yeah, this will be strong. If Scott can yeah, have okay. another turn and another end phase with Yamato on the field, mm -hmm. you might actually be able to see where should pull this one out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it, it's... Oh, yep, you know. that's what I was expecting. Oh, no. Missile tain. Yeah, there you yeah. go. So if he has a defensive trap guard right now, this could really be problematic. And he had the second. The Taylor. second effect copy. That's right, so. uh, pretty. I'd say that uh, seals the deal pretty yeah. well. But yeah. let's see if he's got the crane to keep the. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like he's bluffing it. I mean, there's no point in bluffing it if you don't have it here. Yep. I mean, if you effect veil it, I would. Oh, wow. I mean, if you're effect veiling, I almost assume like you have the out there. I mean, it, it might have been more advantageous to wait for uh, Zachary to go off a bit, but. Uh, We're just going to update the life points yep. real quickly. Because the uh, Bujin Yamato was at 1,900 when it was attacked, and it was attacked by 2,100, so he should lose 200 life points. Yeah. So. It looks like he had another Yamato oh, to another Yamato. throw out, but I, I, I don't see how that does very much for him at the moment. Yeah. I mean, obviously the Yamato is the Oh, and a compulsion evacuation like that would be brutal. I mean, Zachary only has a few trap guards, and of course any he potentially sided in in the dark. See, compulsory evacuation device, one of those cards, the tempo swing of losing your normal summon against a deck like Dragon Rulers or Dragoonity Rulers is just tremendous. It's been one of those cards which it took so long for it to become playable. It took so long for players to realize how well suited it could be in formats with Exceed Monsters and Synchro Summons. And we didn't see it at all when Synchros were around. And now we're starting it's to see really it with Exceed Monsters. It's really one of those fantastic cards. And the, cards, the equivalent of that effect in Magic the Gathering has been an incredible, incredible asset for several decks over the course of the past few years. And... In Yu-Gi-Oh, the idea of your opponent losing their normal summon can it oftentimes mean they just lose their turn. It's like Phoenix Wing Blast, the chainable ability of Cabal's and the utility of just bouncing Exceed and Synchro Monsters, which are problematic. So, like in this situation, Zachary was able to use the Wing Blast, or use the Compulsory, stops God from being able to... Oh, here's the Black Horn of Heaven we were Looks talking like about. Got a yeah. So that was what his back was. Darkness Metal, but yeah. yeah, Black Horn of Heaven did stop that at least. I'm surprised he didn't... Could he have? Did he, did he tribute for Mistletane, or could he have just Blackhorn of Heaven the Mistletane and then kept Yamato on the field? I, he tri when he tributed for it, I thought he could have Blackhorn to Heaven, uh, Blackhorn Heaven it, because it's not a yeah, absolutely. I mean, he just a, it's a summoning. Condition. Yeah, he summoned Doxy God Veil, and then he tributed to Special Summon. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, questionable plays, but interesting, interesting decision there. It would be interesting to see what his mindset was on yeah. that. Yeah, well, there's another so, Yamato. Uh, the, the but, Yamato. Yeah. Yeah, the normal summon for Bujins is so, mm -hmm. so very important because they need that Yamato or a Mikazuchi, just some form of Beast Warrior on the field, or at least another Bujin, so they, next turn they can overlay into the Bujin Exceed, uh, which is just outrageously powerful. But at this point, it's just it's not looking that good for him. His tempo has been shut down pretty hard. Now, he did get a turtle in the grave. Absolutely. So it is something for him. So if he has the crane to back it up, uh, then he should be in a, in a pretty good position with Yamato right now. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see. 
Luckily, these players are playing at a much quicker pace than our previous round, and if things continue this way, we'll potentially be able to have the winner come into the booth and have a quick interview about some of the decision points in the game. I certainly have a few decision, a few questions to ask of both Zach and Scott, depending on the outcome. So it'll be fantastic. If there's any questions or things you're curious about, you can always put it into the ARG live Twitch chat. We'll see it, and perhaps we can ask one of the players. So if you have any questions for Zachary or Scott, depending on the winner, just let them know. Let us know, and we'll ask. Absolutely. Yep, there is the crane. So uh, during that damage between Blaster and Bujin Yamato, that will push Bujin Yamato to 3,600 attacks. That will be 800 damage dealt yep, to Zach. 800 Zach, damage dealt to Zachary. And the Blaster will go to the grave. Mm -hmm. So this will be the first. Did you take into consideration the tanky as well? Uh, yes, but whenever you use Crane, it sets the attack. Oh, yes, touche, 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 touche. So it does not gain that tanky da that extra tanky yeah. damage. You know, Konami makes effects that are that are similar to other company to other cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! history to this game's history. I think it's confusing. All right. Well, this is definitely a little bit of a tempo swing for him. It looks like it's uh, falling a bit more in his favor. I think it was a pot of duality I just saw drawn. So that's just going to come right into an attack, kill the Maxi. So at the point where you're having to set Maxi, you know you're in a pretty bad position. So. Mm -hmm. So let's see what we have that's in there. Oh, yeah, he just immediately picks emptiness. And, and a crow. crow yeah, okay. absolutely just picks that emptiness immediately. At this point, there's probably not much better that he could have picked. I mean, yeah, he's in a pretty solid position now. But the yeah, only absolutely. thing that's really going to hit the Yamato is a dark hole. Uh, and, you know, the doll depends on what his set is. Because if his it's, if it's set is a forbidden lance, then dark hole doesn't do, you know, jack to you. So the, the individual asking if Zachary signed up Maxi, he actually won the first game without seeing a single card that Scott played. Zachary opened up with an incredible opening hand, utilizing tons of Dragoonity effects, Garuda, the Wind Spirit, yep. Blackwing Zaphiros, all these interesting combos. And Scott, look at his six cards, scooped them up. So Zachary has no idea what Scott is playing. So if you see any interesting cards in Zach's deck, even though this is game two, please take into consideration that he didn't see a single card and he was in the dark in game two. Now, of course, he could have, uh, as we mentioned, he could have played out game one, and there may have been a comeback play there, but then that would have given Scott or Zach the knowledge of what Scott is playing and given him an advantage inside that game. Yeah, I mean, the likelihood isn't that you're going to win this. Really no point in trying to play out. So, uh, Yamato attacks into a mirror force. Now, that's interesting. I mean, if he doesn't have any follow-up, Zachary might be able to buy himself enough turns to wear that mirror force. Yeah, he's only setting the back row. So the Yamato engine has been ceased. Uh, that hurts Scott so much more than, you know, it is necessary. I think he just drew, drew and set bottomless. So he's got some pretty good defense set up right now. Uh, All it takes is one trap stone. Is Zachary playing any trap stones? Zachary is not playing trap stones. He sides like, them, he but I don't two. know if he put them in. I almost think like you just automatically would side that card in, Depend even regardless of what they're playing. Well, he did draw into either a Tempest or a Sword. I assume it was the Sword. Giving him now a pseudo Pot of Greed effect, of course. You say pseudo, but I mean, he's, still get, he's still going plus one, or plus one on it easy. Well, no, see, the thing is, with Pot of Greed, the way I always look at it is if you activate Pot of Greed, you add two new cards to your hand. Mm -hmm. When you activate Sword, you add two new cards to your hand, and you still have that dragon in your hand. Exactly. Because you searched it, or you could have searched something that was better, like a Phalanx or a Duck. Yep. So... When I say Pot of Greed, in some situations, that might mean even better than Pot of Greed in terms of the overall effect it has on the game. So he follows it up with the Ducks, and we'll see how this turns out. I mean, we know that Scott has the Vandy's Emptiness set, so he certainly has a way to respond to this. Oh, there it is. And it looks like Zachary might have a Typhoon or something. Oh, no, he was fidgeting a card in his hand, which... Almost gave off a tell that he has some type of response, but we'll see what ends up happening. Man, his emptiness is flipped. Phalanx cannot hit the field, and Ducks will hit, go in for 1,500. Well, look at this. Scott still has no creatures yet. That mirror force on the Yamato could be terribly problematic for Scott. I mean, if he has emptiness and a bunch of cards he can't play. Yep. Now, looking forward to the next set, there is a new Bujin, uh, Bujingi coming out that does prevent destruction, uh, whereas Turtle prevents targeting. Uh, there's another one coming out that prevents destruction by battle or card effects. So that's one I'm pretty sure that Scott would have loved to have had right now. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wait, you know, another couple months before we can actually use that guy. Absolutely. 
Scott's only down to 24. If he bricks for two of my draw phases, it looks like Zachary might be able to just win with the Ducks. I mean, I'm not sure. It depends what Scott's been drawing and setting because it makes it sound like that Tanky is a dead draw, which... I'm pretty Granted, sure he's got a Tinky in hand, too, right yeah, now. Yeah, that's, that that's, that's crazy. That yeah. There's there's nothing he can really... I mean, at this point, I would just activate a card uh, almost just to get emptiness off the field so I can put a monster out. Yeah, it's but a tough position. If you can't, I mean, if it's bottomlesses and things like that, let's see the situation. He's going to activate Compulsion. He's like, all right, yep, sure, that's fine. Your emptiness dies. Yep, I'm in good position. Make sure the emptiness dies. Yep, there it is. I think it may have been a better idea to take the 15 and compulse either on your turn or the end phase, but I mean, presumably just on your turn. That way, you do not give Zachary a main phase 2 to just go off like he is, unless he has, I mean, he has, obviously he has our black cone heaven. Okay. See, but now he still has dragon rulers and whole nine yards, so. If he survives this turn without Zachary putting a huge exceed or a synchro monster on the field, perhaps it was a good decision, but is a 1,500 points of life worth it? Some will argue it is. I mean, it's certainly a debatable point. Let's see what Zachary can figure out now. Yeah, I do bear in mind it would have been more than 1,500 because the Ducks was at 19 instead of oh, geez, 15 yeah. because it gains oh, yeah, you know. from each monster. So he would have been left with a measly you know, 500 life points. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, but, you know. yeah, Scott is still at 35. Is that right, 35? It was previously? It was, uh, it was at, I thought it was 24 previously. Yeah, it was at oh, yeah, it was at 24. So Scott's still at 24. Yeah, sorry about that. Yep, just having a few technical difficulties yeah, I mean, with uh, life point meter there. You see, well, when you're talking about life points, life points are a resource. So even though it takes half your life points, you really need to look at it. What position am I going to get in if I allow this attack to go through? What position am I going to get in if I use Compulse on my turn or my opponent's end phase? It's one of those things where you're at the point of the game where you need to make a play that stabilizes and put you in a position to win. And sometimes taking life points is what it takes to put you in a position to win. Sometimes it's okay to take damage. Sometimes it's okay to keep your bottomless set. Yep. Because the fact of the matter is you have a hand, you have back rows, you have something that can go over the top of what your opponent's done, and then all of a sudden you're still in a game-winning position and you still have your bottomless, you still have your this, you still have your that. So life points are a resource. And I think that was really shown in the tell that format where players would leave their solemn judgment set, and even though you pay half your life points for it, you would take damage. Yep, I'll take the starter directly. Yep, yep, yep. All of a sudden you drop. They're Dark Arm Dragon, you make a play where you take control of the field, and all of a sudden I still have all two of my Solemn Judgments on, so yep. I have more Solemn Judgments than you have cards. So it really translates to even this compulsory situation we had here where life points are a research, so they it just really depends. Are. Yep, absolutely. So, of course, with the Draco Sack, like we were talking about. And then with the Draco Sack, when he tried to use the effect to make tokens, he did Fiendish Chain it, so he is kind of stuck here for a moment. I mean, uh, it's interesting to see if he decides to tribute off to kill the tank. I don't think there's well, any point. at this I mean, point, he can't, because he's already tried to activate the effect to make... Uh, or, no, I guess he could. No, yeah, you contribute it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no other card. If there was another card, I mean, the same time I don't. Do that, I think so. that's what he's thinking about. But is there a reason to put any dragon rules in the grave? Is there any reason not to leave it on the field? I really don't think so. Uh, at this point, no. I think it's better just to leave the Draco Sec out. Yeah, absolutely. And try and try again next turn. Yeah. Hmm. So see, this is the problem with Wujin. I mean, you have the card with pseudo honest, but if you don't have that type of access. How do you deal with creatures on the field like this? A few back rows and a big creature like that. It's really been the drawback of decks like Fire Fist and Luisian throughout this entire format. It's really difficult to fight through Draco Sacks, even if it's under Fiendish Chain, just huge creatures that are on the field. So yep. we'll see if he can muster up something. He obviously won't be conceding here. You check the cards in hand, and Zachary only has that one single card in his hand, so. If somehow Scott can deal with the Draco Sack and establish a way to stop Zachary from using his Dragon Roof perhaps a Kaiser Coliseum or something, we might be able to see him get back in this game. But Kaiser Coliseum would actually be very nice right now. Oh, I mean, it would be fantastic. I mean, if he gets Draco Sack up the field, it's good. If he doesn't, then it really is almost irrelevant, because then he yep. can just tribute the Draco Sack, kill the Kaiser Coliseum. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this is all under the impression that he does have something to back up the Yamato as well, because if he puts out the Kaiser Coliseum without mm -hmm. a crane in hand... Mm -hmm. Then that's not going to do much yeah, for him, because yeah, yeah. they can just make a dragon run him over. He actually has that card. He has his cards across in his hand. So let's see what he does. He ends up summoning... Bujingi Turtle. So yeah, the that turtle means that he's in a pretty sour position. Uh, yeah, and then plays the cards across him. So now he just passes it back. So Zachary will have the opportunity to kill the cards across him if he chooses to. Yep. But the... Let's see. At this point, there are lots of things he can do. Because he I mean, can oh, just pop off the Draco sack to hit the Kaiser Coliseum. Uh, oh, and then just have a... A turn. Yep. A, a normal turn with no back rows. So, yeah, this is exactly what he's going to do. Yeah, fantastic. Yep. He knew exactly what was up. Perhaps Scott hoped that Scott... Perhaps Scott hoped that Zachary would not realize that interaction. But, yep. yeah, he's just going to uh, scoop him up. He just realizes. He sees the writing on the wall. And that will end our round two here in Worcester, Massachusetts. Zachary Levin.